Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Um, I have 65 slides, so I'll be talking very fast, and uh, sorry for that. Um, so yeah, Samim is my name. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, just so I get acquainted, to uh, about new patterns for creation, so basically uh, how I think about applying machine learning to creativity. And to, to start with this, what's been happening the last couple of years, but it's a longer trajectory, is that we've seen an explosion of research and experiments at the intersection of creativity and computer science. And I'm going to use the word computer science here. You can interchange it with AI if you like. That's the safer word. Now, generative creation or generative design is, is kind of an umbrella term, and I'm not going to define it for you because it's called different things in different industries. But generally, you can think about it making things that make things. And so my Twitter feed lately, especially the last couple of years has turned into just an onslaught of, of interesting creative projects. As an example here, hobbyists generating entire world maps and uh, con fake country names and fake flags, or uh, folks generating ma uh, magazine covers, or why not just generate some faces just for fun, uh, just randomly or semi-randomly, uh, generating design suggestions with different systems. There's, there's hundreds of these examples now. While we're at it, why not just generate some hip-hop lyrics or this just came out last week, generating entire worlds with about 7 billion planets in there that you can all uniquely go and explore. Generating jewelry is becoming a big trend. Uh, bicycles on the, on the upside is becoming a trend. Or even architecture, room scale stuff here by Michael Hansmeier. And I, I mean, literally every day, uh, this is becoming something that on every, every day there's just five or six of these experiments apparently popping out. So there's a real explosion. And th so there's a, no shortage of fundamental questions that this, uh, this type of works raise. So one of them is, what are we talking about? Artificial intelligence systems performing creative tasks. That's one of these fundamental um, questions you might raise. And the second one I always get asked, what are you talking about? Is this creativity you're talking about? Now, I'm, I'm going to refer to quite a specific uh, subsection of creativity, which goes back to how John Cleese of Monty Python defines it. Creativity is not a talent, it's a way of operating. Uh, it's up for grabs, you can define it however you like, but this is an operational definition there. Now, uh, further questions, which I'm personally more interested in than philosophical questions, is how do we think about uh, this ongoing explosion in and the intersection of creativity and AI conceptually, and how do we rapidly start to build systems with this in production, <coughs> in industry, etc. Very important questions I've been contemplating for quite a while. And one way I've uh, recently started in the last year, so to approach this is by through the lens of Christoph Alexander's work, design patterns. You might have uh, seen these in uh, uh, OOP programming if you're uh, familiar with coding, or if you're in architecture directly with Alexander's work. Um, but I mean, more, more, more uh, fundamentally, you could say the last kind of very transformative design patterns are things like undo, redo, copy, paste, maybe even the computer mouse. So I think we're heading to uh, a new set of design patterns that are equally powerful as undo, redo, the mouse, if not more powerful. And so our team, we've been trying to come up with uh, what you could call the periodic table of creative AI, uh, kind of a design pattern uh, set that allows you to use them to rapidly build systems. And I'm going to walk you through three of these. I hope I get through all of them. Uh, think of these as modular design patterns that you can stick together as a designer to work with machine learning systems uh, without becoming a code monkey. Uh, the first one I'm going to walk you through is the explorer pattern. The whole um, notion here is eliminating creative design spaces with machine learning. And uh, to, to give you a frame of reference here, I mean, as creatives, you might be quite familiar with this. I mean, this is a reality in all creative fields at the moment. You start with an empty page. You're trying to do music. You're trying to design uh, an illustration or something like that. You always start with an empty page. You have this magic spark, and you're supposed to come up with, with something fantastic on the other hand. And, and of course, this is a, is a bit of a simplification because every creative task, what you're really doing is you're, you're probing a very large design space, a possibility space in your head without assistance usually. And if, if you would have a bird's eye view on this process, you would end up with something like this potentially, many, many options explored. Now, um, of course, exploring these design spaces manually like we all do every day is, is very much like this. Uh, they say, well, maybe it's uh, hunting a needle in the haystack. I think that that's absolutely wrong. It's uh, hunting a needle in a moving flock of birds. Uh, that's, that's how design processes usually uh, type out. And uh, the reality is if you're doing this manually like we 
tend to do these days or semi-manually with tools like a Photoshop, uh, this is the reality you're confronted with. You know, you're trying to do, explore this design space and what you end up is in local minima and you get wonderful stuff like David Hasloff, which is just, in my perspective, hasn't explored the design space far enough, potentially. Or maybe it's good, maybe I'm wrong. And to illustrate this further, I'm going to use a, special, a specific case here, which is font design. I'm originally from Switzerland, so this is very near to my heart. And font design, just for you who've done it, you know, this is an art form, a craft that takes 10 years, if not more, to master. And even then, in Switzerland, if you call yourself uh, a font designer, you will be laughed out of the room. Uh, so it's good you're not Swiss. Um, and now, here's an alternative approach of doing this. Um, this is a, an experiment on Neil Campbell that came out already 2000. Uh, 14, but it's quite relevant here. And this is uh, building a font explorer. This is the design pattern we're talking about. So how can we use uh, machine learning to, to make this font design process a bit different? And what we do is we take 1,000 fonts, the, the kind of Helvetica's Arials of this world, just dump it all into the model. We'll create a generative model out of that. We're modeling basically a, a possibility space. And I'm going to spare you the details here, but uh, what, what ha happens at the other end is that you get a design space explorer, uh, which in this case, you have this wonderful 2D uh, projection of uh, the design space of 1,000 fonts, and interactively you can explore it and see, well, at the top right there's a Helvetica, and down there there's a, a serif, as a, and so forth. And so very rapidly with this you get a, an overview of what's been done already in the space, and you can very quickly home in, well, maybe I'm designing something in the uh, vicinity or neighborhood of, 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 of right, left, or whatever. Now, uh, you can take this further, of course. This is a, a second project by Eric Barnison from this year. You can also start to generate uh, not just scene fonts, so your typical Helvetica, et cetera. You can start to generate monster fonts as well, which is somewhere in between. You get these kind of monstrosity fonts there, which is interesting for uh, getting that creative spark, seeing un unseen things, where a human designer can jump in from there and actually home in deeper. Now, uh, one very neat thing of, of this design explorer pattern is that you can uh, always map it out as a, as a two-dimensional map. So here you see, uh, again, these are, in this case, 10,000 fonts all nicely mapped out. And you can see uh, up there there's a group of fonts, etc. Now, uh, two-dimensional maps is just one way of, of exploring this generative model, if you like, this probabilistic model. Another way is using simple vector math. And I'll illustrate this jumping away from fonts with faces. So this, this uh, model was trained on lots and lots, millions actually of faces, celebrity faces, and you can start to do interesting things with just simple vector math. You can say, well, maybe a man with glasses minus uh, uh, a man without glasses plus a woman with glasses, and you get, you know, you can start to generate stuff with simple vector math, and you get interesting results. And of course, you can't just do this with faces, you can do this with any image type. With this specific model, this is Pokemons, generating new Pokemons, which is very relevant to everybody here, I'm sure. Um, now, let's jump domain just to make the point that that this is clearly not just about fonts or faces, because that would be quite useless. Uh, this is photography. This is a project by uh, Tom White from this year. This is called uh, Smile Vector, where again, it's the same data set, actually, where they use, uh, it's called Celeb A. It's uh, uh, 200,000 faces of celebrities. You dump it in a generative model, you train it, and at the end, the interesting thing here is that there is uh, still some extra vectors. So in this data set, he knows when people are smiling in the data set. So what you can do at the other end is now give it a new picture and say, well, please make him smile. So if you think about photography, we had smile detection, now we're going to smile injection. So you can make anybody smile. And then this is the future of photography you see right there. Uh, it's a design space explorer, quite interesting. We can take this a step further and say, well, uh, why not actually do the same for eyes? And then you can see these wonderful people that uh, frankly look much better if their eyes are weirdly moving. And obviously if you combine this and a couple of things like skin color modeling or whatever, you've got basically generative photography, which is something you'll hear more about soon. Now let's jump uh, domain because it's just fun to show that this is uh, explorer pattern is really applicable everywhere. This is the same concept applied to fashion, where now we're asking the model, well, you've trained on lots and lots of pictures of fashion items. Um, take this picture and show me how I would look with a red sweater or a blue sweater and so forth. And so very rapidly you can start to explore different types of fashion designs. We can do the same with uh, 3D modeling. This is from uh, three weeks ago from DeepMind research, uh, where they're now trying to do similar concepts for 3D modeling, which is quite interesting because this model actually only saw some of these 3D objects from from the front, but it actually can uh, predict what it might look from the back. So you, you get this kind of interesting exploration of 3D stuff. 
This is from a little bit, uh, from a couple of years back, but I'm a big fan of, of this researcher, Rodney Murray Smith. Uh, he did this with motion data, Kinect data. So he trained a generative model on Kinect data. Now the interesting thing here is, when you're making a new motion, something weird, uh, this model can tell you very quickly, the motion you're doing right now is in that space of, of the model. So you're trying to do an impossible motion, it will immediately give you feedback on that. Very interesting pattern of the uh, Explorer pattern. We can do the same for music, of course. This specific one was music, files, lots and lots of music, but as well emotional uh, tagging of the music. Uh, so that this map that you see here actually is, uh, if you draw a line on this uh, map of, I think it's 100 or 200,000 songs, you're going from happy land uh, to sad land, and it creates a playlist for you. And it's quite interesting, and you can start to map out uh, you know, the, the map of uh, country music, or the map of, uh, and so forth. Um, and now, uh, we had the uh, pleasure of working with, uh, with this pattern uh, earlier for a client project for a, a quite famous music group. And the idea was to how can we generate a music album, and this pattern came, uh, came handy. Uh, and um, to, for some context, modern music making really is about you have a large grid of samples, and you're trying to find the winning combination in that sample. And usually a musician does this manually. And the problem with manual, obviously, is you, you fall into the trap of your memory, and you just tend to repeat what you've done 20 times successfully, and the 21st time it's boring. So what this does is uh, we train a generative model. In this case, it's actually a genetic algorithm that tries lots and lots of combination, and it does novelty search, meaning it always tries to find something new with every generation. And um, it, it, it starts to just every second generate a new song combination from a grid of 5,000 by 5,000 samples. And finally, we can map this out in a beautiful map of, uh, this is 10,000 potential songs that you can start to interactively navigate. And so again, what we're trying to do is not start with empty sheets, but we're trying to start with lots of possibilities and home in. So you hear some of these results that the machine has generated here. And it's an interactive thing, so this is an artist's tool to get inspired and then to say, well, I like this, let me get Manuel up here. All right, um, now to, to wrap this up, the Explorer pattern is really about illuminating design spaces with generative models, and it has applications across every creative discipline you can, you can think of. Uh, all of, of you would actually have great fun in your jobs using such models. And uh, it's a key component of assisted creation systems. So systems that turn the design process into a reusable and testable type of art form, if you like. And I think you'll hear a lot about this. Now, um, I'm going to jump to the second pattern, uh, which is style transfer. And you might have seen on your Twitter feeds a lot of this in the last six months where the notion was really, well, we have an image, and we're trying to take the style of the image and apply it to a second image. And of course, all these things were generated here. Uh, so we you know, give it an image, and we say, well, please transfer the style of image A to image B, and you get these uh, wonderful things here. Um, and of course, this is where it gets quite interesting, because the entire machine learning community, all these uh, wonderful PhDs uh, finishing their research, got very excited about this type of artistic research. And so you have a, a, a whole bunch of brains jumping on this, resulting in 25 research papers, PhD research papers, some of them, in just the last six months. And here's some of the results. This is from a colleague of ours, a Neural Doodle. Uh, interesting here is that it's a style transfer, but in the middle you have a sketch. So you can actually just doodle like a like a retarded two-year-old or something, and it will take the sketch as a, uh, as a semantic uh, map there, basically, to do that uh, style transfer guided. And you can very quickly see this is actually now going towards something like a Photoshop 6.0. Oh, well, they're probably already at 11. Um, we can, uh, in also in the last couple of months, we've seen this same principle applied to video. Uh, we've seen it in real time. So this is a, a project by Gene Kogan that came out a couple of months back, which is applying it in real time to mirror. So you're standing in front of this mirror, and it's the Picasso mirror. You always look like Picasso. It's a wonderful thing. I look always very beautiful in the morning with this. Um, and of course, the, the style transfer pattern is more than just what you've seen on your Twitter feeds. I'm going to uh, open it up a bit for you. This is also research from this year, where this is about st sketch uh, cleaning up automatically. So in, in Japan, huge, huge manga comic industry, this cleaning up step of taking a rough sketch and cleaning it up, that's done manually. This thing does it automatically. It takes about 10 seconds, and it cleans up your sketch 
sketches for you. Uh, of course, another uh, ab uh, abstraction or another uh, uh, realization of the style transfer is automatic colorization. So you have a black and white image, you ask the convolutional neural net in that case, please make me a colored version. And I had to, because there's so much research coming out in this space, I had to stick another image on there just last minute uh, because the results are really getting uh, by the day better. It's quite a fascinating one if you think about all the black and white imagery are kind of collective uh, heritage, uh, we're going to see this in color soon. Now, uh, I'm going to make some uh, predictions here, which is uh, style transfer. This is not a blip on the radar. This is going to stay with us like the mouse. Uh, high quality real time style transfer everywhere, style transfer for every media type, and style transfer is going to be in every creation tool. So you better get used to it. The, the, the all media types, as demonstrated here, this is all from this year. We got style transfer on 3D, we got it on 2D, we got it on music, and we got it on text. If, if I forgot a media type, please tell me, then we'll develop that as well. Uh, and of course, uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. This is an experiment I did early this year, which is with a comic artist of using this interactively, of letting a comic artist interactively draw and get four or five different style suggestions, and she can pick in real time. Oh, I like it with, a, with a, uh, uh, this or that style. Now, um, in conclusion, the style transfer pattern uh, is really about making styles interchangeable. And it has applications, again, across all creative disciplines. And the thing, this is more a provocation, but you can think about it, which is uh, style used to be the defining factor of many creative disciplines. And I, I believe strongly this is going away radically. So the commodification of style or even the democratization of style, depending on your political uh, belief system. Uh, and so if your profession relies on stylistic things, then I'm I have bad news for you, but we can talk about this later. And here are some examples uh, I ran uh, earlier this year, which is uh, Charlie Chapman's The Kid in Color. Look it up on YouTube, it's quite fun in color. All right, final pattern, a uh, synesthetic pattern, multimodal representation for creative tasks. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, so what do I mean by synesthetic? We all know synesthesia, but that's not what we're talking about in principle here. What we're talking about is the deep learning, machine learning version of that, which is multimodal, which means we're training one model with sound and images and so forth in one model. Um, and of course, uh, here's some results of this. Maybe this illustrates it best. This is a, a research by Ryan Kiros of University of Toronto, which I had super fun with uh, end of last year. Now, the concept is simple. You take an image, you analyze the image with a deep neural net, and you get information about the image. There's a, a man in the image, there is a, and so forth. And then you've trained an, uh, a second model on text. In this case, it was uh, two gigabytes of romantic, cheap novels. And then you ask, the image, uh, you ask the model, well, please write me a short story that describes the image. And you end up with these absolute beautiful monstrosities. So this sumo fighter, he was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. He wanted to strangle me. Consider the beautiful boy I have become wearing his boxers. Now, the important thing to, to notice is that this thing is generated, so I can generate unlimited amounts of this, which I have, so go and look it up online. There's a movie and everything. It's quite ridiculous, but the story gets more ridiculous, which is uh, you can train it on different stuff. So this is hip-hop. Uh, you can generate hip-hop, which we've done for a big consumer brand, and it goes, in the OG of my life, I got the OG hit and so forth, OG being original gangster. This is the first neural net that had to be censored because the client was very shocked as he was going fuck and shit all the time time in front of a big client meeting. Anyway, different story. In conclusion, the synesthetic pattern gives you multi multimodal representation for, and translation for creative tasks. So this, this idea that we're just stuck in, I am an image designer and so forth, I'm a musician, this is, in my opinion, absolutely passe. We're going to a world where this multimodality will become a standard. And to make the point, this is, a image, uh, this is a text to image model you see here. So you type a sentence, it generates an image for you. Extrapolate that down a couple of years and you'll get movies like this. Oh, so, okay, I'm going to wrap up now. So, in conclusion, generative AI systems are making a wide range of creative tasks more accessible. And I mean radically more accessible. Uh, this is just the beginning now, but you can see that cost curve between novices and experts coming down radically. Uh, what this will be in production systems is what we call generative pipelines. Think of this as end-to-end data-driven creative processes. Well, at the moment, you have lots of, of kind of uh, messy, untestable things in your creative pipeline. Let's change that. There's a lot of benefit in this. And so this was what uh, I was introduced in the beginning. Potentially, this is more provocation. This might lead to a scenario which is the democratization, escalation of creativity. It's a provocation, but we've, we've written a half 
half a book about it. So you can go and read that. And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I love you all. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.